of the Australian Open. Thank you to those that have sent questions in advance so we can get straight into things. Hoping to keep this one around the half hour mark, probably maybe a little bit over if we've got a lot of questions. So some of you tend to come and ask a load right near the back end and we extend. So if you're here, if you get those questions in as early as possible and I will work my way through as many as I can. So the first round is over and out at the Australian Open. I personally, I'm just preparing myself for my first all-nighter this coming night, so massive respect to you if you've already done two of those. Let me know if you have. Uh, the order of play for the first day of second round action is jam-packed, so I don't think I have an option this time around to try and catch up with replays. But to be honest, compared to recent Grand Slams, it's been a fairly quiet first round. Not many big upsets, really, I wouldn't say. Uh, you've got all your key contenders on the men's side and the women's side moving through. Uh, but there are some outsiders that have fallen, so on the women's side, a few people might have been surprised to see Azarenka and Sakari, Victoria Azarenka, Maria Sakari, go out early. On the men's side, Roberto Bautista Agut usually plays fantastic tennis during this part of the season. He went out to Radu Albert. Uh, Mar Ilic, former finalist here, finalist in 2018, he went out but had a tough draw in Grigor Dimitrov. So I think a lot of the kind of key names that have gone out have really gone out in some tough draws or under some tough circumstances. And I've already seen some questions come in on that. So I'm going to try and get to some of the questions that came in earlier. Um, maybe if I refresh the page because they were there but it's not showing me them at the moment. Do keep the questions coming through. If I look to the side I've got my drawers here, I've got the questions here which is why I'll be looking down and uh, yeah that, that's why I keep looking over to the side so uh, don't, don't worry if I keep doing that because it will happen. I can't get to the questions that were asked before which is annoying. I think I remember some of them off the top of my head. Uh, there was one about the hard quarantine, I remember specifically. So let's kick off on that note. Uh, someone asked what I thought of some of the results, like the Azarenka result, like the Sakari result, and whether the hard quarantine, what kind of an impact that had. So for anyone who's been living under a rock, basically when the players got to Melbourne, uh, there were chartered flights that they had to go on, specific flights they were assigned to, and on a number of those flights there were positive COVID tests once the flights got to Australia. So everyone had tested negative before boarding, but after they got to Melbourne, some people tested positive. That meant that a number of players, coaches, whoever was on the plane, whether it had been a positive test, they had to quarantine a strict quarantine for two weeks. So couldn't go out to practice, couldn't go out to use the gym, confined to one room. Uh, there was a lot of consternation about this. And to be fair, it was a handful of players out of all the players that were put in this quarantine uh, that were very vocal on social media saying, didn't know this was going to happen, that we'd be classified as a close contact just by being on a plane with a positive test. And uh, they were saying that probably wouldn't have come, some of them, if that was the case. I, I think maybe now people understand why a little bit. Um, I want to rewind a bit and say, you know, these players were given a lot of flack. And it's understandable. I have to say it's understandable because it is a global pandemic and in a way it's a miracle that international tennis events are able to operate in this current situation. A lot of work went into setting those tournaments up and making them able to happen uh, in the situation that we're currently in with the world. So I understand that. I understand why people thought that the players, you know, should just have been quiet and got on with it. Uh, what I th think people don't understand in general is there's, there's a lack of understanding uh, of two things. Uh, one, the sport of tennis, right? Tennis is more... And I, I'm sorry because I know some people watching this will totally get this, but tennis is more than just going on court and playing your match. For example, I'm a commentator, so I'll sit in the booth and I'll commentate on matches, but as much a part of my job as what I do when I'm on the mic is the 
work and the preparation that I do beforehand. I'm paid for both of those things. So for the players, you know, they weren't jetting off on a holiday to Dubai like the influencers out there that are absolutely making a mockery of this current situation. They were going out to work and their work was not just what happens on the court, it was what happens outside of the tournament, the training in the gym, the keeping their stamina up, keeping their fitness up. And so really for them to stay in a single room for a fortnight was a very big deal. And I think that they had a right to feel kind of hard done by in the situation. Uh, some people were then saying, well, they were given the information, so it's on them. Tennis has a massive communication problem. We saw it last year when, at the beginning of the pandemic actually, when players were in Indian Wells and were finding out that the tournament was cancelled via social media. And, you know, I've heard it said that these close contact rules were mentioned on a Zoom call. So fair play, but there's a lot of hypocrisy out there. I mean, don't go telling me that there's not um, one in two people that haven't missed a, a, a university lecture they were supposed to be at or haven't been on a meeting they were supposed to be at. I, th I think there was a lot of judgment out there. And really, you know, it's an organization's job to organize fine if they said it on the Zoom call, but really, you know, you're in control of that aspect of the situation. If you really wanted the players to be happy and if you really wanted them to be aware, be aware even of something this serious and something that has this much of an impact on their job, you should have been sending out a complete email with all of the requirements documented in that email. It is bad management to have your players who you're supposed to be catering for have to go left, right and center, go to all the little bits of small print, try and just dig through to find out this information. And even the bit of printed information I saw was not absolutely 100% specific. So it might just sound like I'm coming to the defense of the players here. I, I just want to point out that aspect of things because there was a lot of um, hot water, cold water, whichever one it is coming at them, you know, because there were some vocal players and I completely understand, you know, the, the, um, probably the annoyance and the frustration of people witnessing that. But I think we're seeing now, you know, how serious that two week lockdown was. And honestly, you know, there were players that had chosen not to travel because of the pandemic anyway. If players had been 100% clear on that two week hard quarantine rule, and to be clear, they had been given special exemptions to go. It was not the same for everyone else, which, you know, I can't say I agree with, but that was the, the conditions the tournament was set up under. So they were expecting to go, have allocated time to practice, etc. And I think if players knew that that was not going to be a possibility, some of them wouldn't have gone because there's high risk of injury. You're going potentially only to play one mount round of a tournament and then leave and people will weigh it up and see whether it's worth it. So that was a long winded way of getting to the root of this and, and getting to the question of did that hard quarantine really have an impact? And I think for some players it did. For some other players, they've probably managed to push through. I think draws definitely have a massive impact. Uh, but let's look at Victoria Azarenka. Um, my friend Jay here saying thanks for jinxing VK. I did say she was up against it with the hard quarantine that she'd had to do because Azarenka is one of those players who, if she'd been able to play at her top level, would definitely have been a threat here. She's a two-time former champion. She's a US Open finalist last year. But the fact is she had to do the two-week hard quarantine and then wasn't able to play a match in the lead up to this event. So she was coming in cold. I saw the end of that match and it was very obvious. Uh, she was just not hitting her stride. You could see it in her face. She was not comfortable. Credit to Jessica Pagula, who has had her own injuries to deal with over the years, and she's coming back strong. Uh, she had good form here last year. She made her first final of the year in Auckland, I think, lost to Serena. Uh, but no, Azarenka was definitely affected. Another big name, Maria Sakkari, also had to do the hard quarantine. Now, I'm not sure if it affected Sakkari so much because she was playing Kristina Mladenovic in round one. And... Mladenovic is a player who I rate tremendously and have done for years. For me, she was one of the five best players in the world in, I think it was 2017, and she's got the versatility and the depth in her game. Uh, it's kind of wild to me how she dips and rises. She's not been in great form, but that was a tough opener. What I will say of that, I watched the back end of this match as well, and I think that maybe the title did catch up to Sakari because they had to play a three-setter after she dropped the first set 6-2. She won the second 6-love, but back end of the match, I think Mladenovic 
did look the more upbeat of the two. Sakari didn't quite have the acceleration on some of her ground strokes, and when it's a close contest like that, those small things can make a big difference. On the men's side, I'm not sure if we've seen it so much. A lot, a lot of the players that had to do the hard quarantine were actually on the women's side, so much so that they made a specific tournament for those players leading up to this event. But end of the day, it was never going to be ideal. Um, I think another part of that question was how's Craig Tiley handled this and stuff. They've done the best that they can, to be honest. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, the, the main motive of the people running this tournament, it's not to please the players to bring the money in. Otherwise, this event just wouldn't be happening because it's not practical during a global pandemic. But, you know, whatever their reasons are for staging this event, it was always going to happen one way or another, less than ideal for the players coming in, but to be able to get a show on the road like this, they are going to be applauded for it at the end of the day. It's just a shame for some players that it is going to cause injury and it is going to cost them probably a, a fairly decent run at a Grand Slam for some of them. So, uh, apologies to take about 10 minutes on that first bit. Uh, thanks for those who've hung around. But yeah, I, I did promise in the preview video that I did that I would touch on this stuff in this video. So, given I spent so long on that one, I might add an extra few minutes to this whole video. What else have we got? Um, what do I think of Guile Monfils' performance against unseeded players? He hasn't won a match since the tour level. Um, I think since the, you mean kind of since the tour came back. What do you think went wrong? Um, love your commentaries. Thank you very much. Um, so with Monfils, it's difficult because he was on such a run prior to the pandemic. And since then, you know, I don't know if there's been a struggle to be motivated during the time off. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, he's got so much natural ability, Monfils, uh, but I'm not sure how much training or high intensity training he was able to have done kind of during the sit, uh, the sit down, during the time off the tour. And yeah, it's difficult to come in and play these high intensity events at the beginning of the season. He's obviously not in a great headspace at the moment. Uh, and it's really tough. This is an example that we see. I think quite a few players have managed to take it in their stride well, but Monfils is at the back end of his career, really. He was playing so some of the best tennis he's played in a number of years before the pandemic interrupted play and that's a tough pill for him to swallow so it's al almost as much a mental issue as a physical issue when he comes back and isn't quite where he was when things left off so yeah I think that's definitely a mental obstacle he had to overcome it was uh very upsetting very sad to see him in, in the kind of the way he was after that match that he lost to open at the Australian Open and uh, yeah he was clearly very bogged down by everything so hopefully he's now got that out of his system and can kind of start building from a lower rung of the ladder I mean he probably had such high expectations for himself coming back having played at the previous level but you know, when you've had months off outside of competition, it is tough to get back off on the right foot. And yeah, he probably did have high expectations for himself that weren't that helpful. Uh, next question. Do you think Serena Williams has a legitimate chance at winning her 24th slam at the Australian Open? I'm glad someone's asked me about Serena because I did want to touch on her opening round match, which I didn't feel got accurate coverage for the performance that she put in. She won 6-1, 6-1 over Lara Siegemans, who just did not hit her level at all. Um, I mean, to, to get to your question straight away, I think she has as much chance as anyone else just because these things are so unpredictable at the moment. Uh, anyone could step up and win it and take advantage. You know, some of the names I'd named as kind of outsiders, dark horses, had already gone out. There are names that I wish I'd mentioned previously that I think have a shot. You could go through most of the draw and make an argument. So for someone of Serena's caliber, you know, 23 Grand Slam titles, why the heck not? Uh, and these conditions, as I pointed out in the preview video, they're faster than usual, so that aids her big serve, that aids her one-two punches, as we saw to an extent in her first round match. So there was some great stuff from Serena in that match. There was some great serving, there was some fire backhands, etc. I did not watch the match live. After the match, I heard her performance referred to as vintage Serena. I think Serena even kind of came out with those words herself. I don't know if she just wanted to get off court. Probably. She's kind of probably sick of this stuff at the moment. Uh, she's, I mean, she's been on tour for a long time now. Uh, but I knew, I mean, 
I've watched Serena for years, and I know that her performances at the beginning of majors these days can often be deceptive, score lines can be deceptive. So I went back to watch that match, and she's not going to win this title at that level, I have to tell you. Uh, it, it was erratic at the beginning, she couldn't find a first serve, Siegerman broke to open. Um, I mean, I'm going to compare the, the results of Serena and Ashley Barty. So Barty won Love and Love over Danka Kovinic last night, or yesterday if you're in Australia, hello, if you're at Brighton early. Uh, Serena won one and one. Both of their opponents made a lot of unforced errors. Now, there were, they made those unforced errors in very different ways. So Siegerman's made those unforced errors and and they were very much unforced errors a lot of them were easy one two punches into the net and just just wild errors whereas Kovinic Barty you know with her repertoire and her ability to be so steady as she extends the points she wasn't necessarily forcing the errors otherwise they would have been classed as forced errors but she was keeping the play going until Kovinic kind of got frustrated went for too much or mistimed etc and I think there was a big difference between the way those unforced errors piled up Barty kept Kovinic playing until she made those errors Serena didn't have to make Siegerman play at all she just that, that's one of the worst performances I've seen from Siegmund, a player who I rate massively. You know, she's got a phenomenal drop shot, and she, I mean, she's she's the best on clay, right? Clay's her best surface. She was not going to be as strong an opponent here, but she could have done more. I think her low standard of play probably made Serena look better than she actually was. And here's the thing, yeah, once she got going, Serena served well. She hit, as I said, some great backhands. Forehand was more iffy. But the biggest standout for me, I'm not going to spend too long on this if you're bored, the, the biggest standout for me was that one of the key issues for Serena from the last Grand Slam, from the Grand Slam before, from the past couple of years, was still there. And that issue being when she's in a winning position in the rally and her opponent has scrambled and managed to extend that rally, she's suddenly unbalanced, she rushes, she's not got the timing. And so whether that's her coming into the forecourt, coming up to the net, trying to finish off and being pushed back, or whether that's just a very good and well-spread one-two punch coming back at her, she'll probably try and go for a winner on the next shot and not have the positioning around the ball to execute. If she's in the forecourt, she's probably out of position. Uh, there were a number of smashes that she missed. There were some sitters when she'd um, forced Siegemund into an uncomfortable position at the net that she missed. And these were overshadowed by the highlights because there were highlights for Serena. But do not be deceived if she doesn't work out that issue of managing to win the longer rallies that she should already have finished she won't win this trophy because that's exactly one of the things that cost her in the semi-final against Victoria as a ranker at the US Open. So do keep an eye out for that. And I really hope that someone in Serena's team is keeping an eye out for that as well, because in my opinion, from what I've witnessed, it's been a long-standing issue. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, I, I don't want to go too far into the negative, but all I saw was positive, brilliant fire, you know, comments regarding that performance. And I, I don't think that it was everything that it was chalked up to be. Okay, next question. Do you think Katie Bolter can make it back into the top 100 by the end of the year? Well, it really depends how well the tour can function, I think, because I think Bolter's proven to everyone beginning of this year that she's still got the level that took her to the top 100 a couple of years ago. Obviously, it was a disappointing outing for her at the Australian Open. She lost in straight sets to Daria Kasakina, uh, but she'd put in a good showing against Naomi Osaka last week in the lead-up event, took her to three sets, uh, and she's got such a clean strike on her bolter. It's pretty flat. Uh, she can do some real damage with that, and she's working on a little bit of variety underneath that as well, which I think is key to making the progression. She's a great fighter as well. She really engages in a match and really backs herself, and these are all great great qualities. So if the tour is running as it should, um, or as we hope it should, uh, throughout this year, if there are a decent number of tournaments on, I, I can definitely see Bolter getting back into that, into that top 100. And uh, a shout out to the, um, what do you call them? Any, the British events, anyway, that were staged last year that I played a part in with commentary and stuff. I think that Bolter probably really benefited from getting to play against the likes of Johanna Conta and, and some of the in some of the better British girls just to 
kind of prepare her for this comeback because she's had a lot of injury to deal with and it is tough to come back so uh fair play to her okay who is favorite on the men's side for winning the french open i think you mean the australian I can't blame you for getting that wrong. It's just so disorientating at the moment. Um, who's favourite? Well, I mean, officially, I think it would be Djokovic, just stats-based uh, history here, eight titles. Uh, the way that him and Nadal have won, I think, nine of the last ten Grand Slam titles between them, it's pretty hard to bet against him. And for that reason, in my preview video, I did say that ahead of the event at the outset, I was basically... my my. My meaning with what I said was basically, I'm taking Djokovic until he or someone else gives me reason to think otherwise. And based on his first round performance, no reason to doubt yet. He was up against Jeremy Chardy. Now, Chardy, tour veteran, longtime player. He used to give players more trouble than he does now. But, you know, he can still ask the questions. He can still move into the court with confidence and has experience playing against Djokovic. I think that Djokovic, you know, he knew when to let him play. He knew when to let him have the volley winner. He knew when to let him stretch him out. But for the big moments, as he always is at the beginning of his majors, or generally is, Djokovic was there. I, I think that he looked increasingly sharp throughout that match and actually looked very comfortable at the back end. I don't think he hit a single unforced error in the final set, in the third set. Uh, the, the exact scoreline there was 6-3, 6-1, 6-2, so pretty breezy there for the top seed. Um, his footwork was looking brilliant. I mean, Djokovic, we know how well he can do bouncing back when he's been stretched out, but I, I don't think he was even stretched that much, really. I think he was allowed to play in between the sidelines quite a lot, and, and Chardy was not going to win the match from that position. You know, Djokovic was just kind of dancing around the court, getting forehands and backhands well-placed, well-timed. And uh, yeah, he seemed to be quite enjoying himself towards the end of that match. So, so far, so good for Djokovic. I haven't seen any reason to replace him as the kind of the favourite for this title yet. But I've definitely seen some guys that could challenge him in the form of, well, Daniel Medvedev, who, who had a very impressive first round. Um, some of the others will have to wait a little while on, but I think Medvedev's had a very convincing start, so we'll see if he can build on that. Um, were you surprised that Angelique Kerber lost in the first round against Bernard Pira? Do you think the hard quarantine was the main reason for that? Yeah, thank you. Kerber was another uh, name that I meant to mention. And she also had to do the hard quarantine. Now, the thing for Kerber is her form is up and down. And, you know, it's hard to say that was the main reason. I think, you know, for all players, like I've said, it's the stamina thing as well at the end of the day. it's There are a certain amount of, I don't know, strength exercises or whatever you can do in your room. But it's the stamina that suffers. It's the strength that does tend to start going as well. And it's just not great preparation for the highest intensity tournaments out there. So... I would think that it had an impact, but also I was very impressed with Pira when she played in Abu Dhabi a few weeks ago. So about three weeks ago, it was uh, first tournament of the year on the WTA side, cracking that ball. Now I commentated on Pira's matches in 2019, and I don't remember her playing like that at all. You know, she's a lefty, really went after a forehand, and for someone like Kerber, you know, she is a counter puncher she can generate some terrific angles but if you've got someone like that in fast conditions going for their shots from the first ball that's just a tricky matchup and kerber didn't really need her stamina there because i think it was over six love six four uh, she was down like six love two love at one stage so yeah you know hard quarantine wasn't the best preparation but in that scenario just that specific match i think pira is in great form and probably enjoying these conditions very much so, there's that. Oh, thoughts on Vivara Gracheva, someone I know you also rate highly. I do, I really do. I first saw Gracheva in 2019, was commentating on her match against Sue Shea, Shea Su Wei, at the City Open. I remember prior to that match, I was scrolling YouTube, like, trying to find footage of her, but she'd mainly played ITF at that stage, so there wasn't much available. Uh, but she'd won a ton of matches at ITF level, and... I was so impressed that someone of that caliber, you know, no real WTA experience, kind of outside the top, uh, outside the top 200, 300 even maybe at that point. And the way she played the big points and the way she took the game on, also some of the variation that she has as well. 
I, I think she's fantastic. I did expect her probably to climb up the rankings. After I saw her then, I think I expected her to climb a little quicker than she has done. But, you know, everyone has their own journey. And at the moment, you know, the players that have won Grand Slams haven't actually won a title at WTA level. So fair play to her. I know she came through her opener um, in, yeah, so against Anna Blinkova, but it was a final set match tie break so again showing her ability in the big moments and sometimes that can make the difference you know everyone at this level of events is there because they can play tennis it's all about how you handle those big moments those pressure moments and i'll be very interested to see if Brasheva can keep going uh just beat a fellow russian in round one and now has another to face in the number 32 seed veronica kudometova who's been playing some great tennis made the abu dhabi final so we shall see we shall see what happens to her um who do i think will finish with the most slams on the men's side i feel like this question comes up in every single live q a and Honestly, I'm going to skip over it this time because it's not Australian Open specific. Sorry, uh, but Federer is up against it at the moment. He's definitely up against it. Um, oh, thank you, Edgar, for retyping your question. If Bianca, and I remember this now. If Bianca Andreescu wins this, how will she rate among the all-time greats? She's won her last nine matches at Slams. Yeah, I think injuries had a helping hand there because she had to withdraw, I think, at the French Open. But then she won the US Open 2019. Didn't play throughout 2020 because she won for last year's Australian Open and then was off the court. Here's the thing, you know, Andreescu, I think she's always going to have these injury struggles. She just seems susceptible to it. Uh, she's so young still. She She's, what, 20, 21 years old and has been sidelined so much already. I have major respect for her that she's managed to perform in the tiny little kind of windows that she has between injury because so many players have been held back by this. I'm looking at Kei Nishikori, who has definitely the talent and, and the big wins to get across the line and win a major, but hasn't been able to because he's been held back by injury so much. And for Andreescu, who's been hit by it, to win a Grand Slam so early on is fantastic. Like, that's brilliant for her. In terms of all-time greats, you know, the history books don't pay heed to the injuries. They, they don't pay heed to that kind of thing. They only remember the numbers. So as great a player as Andreescu is, if she's not able to be on court to win trophies she's not going to go down with the likes of Serena and Venus Williams and, you know, Martina Navratilova, Chris Ever, et cetera. You know, that's not going to happen for her if she can't shake the injuries. So we've got to be hopeful for her because she's a major talent and it's great to have her back in action at the Australian Open. She got her first round win, which meant a lot to her. And she is actually first on Rod Laver Arena in the upcoming day session. She is playing I do have the match schedule up here. Shea Su Wei, uh, a very tricky player, lots of versatility in her game. And Andreescu, we know she can do it all. So I think that's definitely a match to watch there if you want to get across that. Uh, what else do we have? Okay, afterthoughts on Yannick Sinner versus Denis Shapovalov. And Daniel Medvedev's run after tremendous performance against Vasek Pospisil. Love both parts of these questions. Uh, so Yannick Sinner versus Denis Shapovalov. Actually, the, the next question is also asking about this match. It was the highlight so far. It was, it was definitely the stand standout match of that order of play, the one I was really looking forward to, and it's so delivered. I mean, you have to feel for Sinner because I do feel that he was hit by the whole uh, quarantine situation because he was playing this match having won a title the day before. So he had to play a lot of tennis in close proximity last week, and then he had to go straight into a best of five set Grand Slam match that did go to five sets. And in the end, I think that probably did cost him a bit. You could see the weariness at times. I have to say, give the guy credit for making it go the distance because he could easily have collapsed in that fourth set. You could see the energy going from his legs. And um, it might have been cause for concern because he's... Uh, He's quite a silent player on the court. You know, you, ha you have him and, Shep him and Shapovalov, two extremes, right? Is Shapovalov constantly, like, you know, screaming, cheering, getting himself going, and then Sinner just silent after he hits a winner. But, you know, there was such positive energy from him, even as he was struggling in that fourth set. Yeah, I think a bit of fatigue probably did cost him in the fifth. 
And I feel so bad for him because he was my dark horse contender for the semis. Um, as I said, with Shapovalov as backup, that was before the draw was made. In a way, gutted to see that as a first round because I think both players had so much more to give the tournament. If Sinner had survived that match, he would have had a day off, would have been ready to go against Bernard Tomic. And we know that you never know what to expect from Tomic. So that was definitely a winnable match. And we, we, you know, we could see Shapovalov not going deep. I just think that was a, a great advert for the younger generation on the men's tour at the moment. You know, both of them uh, very tactically minded, working through different options, uh, going toe to toe as they tried to utilize the pace of the court as well. Some great cross court backhands from Shapovalov to open up. I think a big difference as well was his confidence in moving up the court. And maybe that's something that Sinner can look to add into his game as well, because it could have saved his legs a bit just to be able to keep those points shorter towards the back end of the match. Um, Shapovalov was even throwing some serve and volleys in there, you know, moving in, trying to finish things off quickly and Sinner could have done with a bit of that because he was having to engage in some demanding exchanges and he was being put on the run a lot so that might be something for him to look at going forward but he definitely based on that match alone and on other matches I've seen he has the fighting spirit he has the repertoire definitely seeing more of both these two and I think Shapovalov will be uh, I don't want to jinx it but fancying his chances of going deeper but I'm intrigued to see that um, match between him and Tomic because Tomic is looking more focused than I've seen him in a long time so I keep half an eye on that what else do we have um, oh Medvedev Medvedev's chances after his performance against Pospisil yeah great stuff from Medvedev um, you know I didn't mention his name in that preview I had to keep it you know succinct and concise and I just kind of mentioned the chances of Djokovic and Nadal and team because they really are the lead names on tour at the moment but the next step for Medvedev now is a grand slam and he's proving that he has the ability it's all about for me whether he has the mentality because I think for a lot of players now you don't beat Daniel Medvedev, you make him beat himself. You get in his head, you frustrate him. That's what happens at the US Open. He brought such a great level, beat Andre Rublev really impressively. And then team was just so rock solid in their first set and it threw Medvedev, like it got into his head. He was getting frustrated, he was getting angry. And that's what you've got to do to beat him at the moment. You've really got to throw him off his game and, and try and make him beat himself. Pospisil wasn't able to do that. I think he got a bit tight today. It had all the potential to be a great match. You know, Pospisil's such a big hitter, very proactive, likes to move in as soon as possible. Would have liked to make more first serves, though. I mean, having that big attacking game is no good if you're not getting your first serves in. Medvedev, though, that forehand's looking brilliant, phenomenal. Whether he hits it cross-court or whether it's an off-forehand, he really opens up that space and he makes the court. It, it, I mean, I've never faced him, but watching him, it looks like he makes the court feel so much bigger than it actually is. He can move into the forecourt as well. He did that a number of times against Pospisil. And he was very ambitious with the angles that he was going for off the return, early in the rallies, putting Pospisil under some real pressure. So... It's good to see that he's so relaxed mentally heading in because another player of his uh, ranking, I mean, is the number four seed here, could have got tight going into that one, uh, knowing that, you know, it's a, it's a tough encounter and it could be an early loss that people aren't expecting. Uh, but Medvedev handled it fantastically and we'll just have to see if he can build on it. I, I think that he can. You know, it looks like a lot of the matches are going to be on his racket. He's in the Nadal half of the draw. Nadal is carrying an injury that he's trying to keep at bay and isn't liking the conditions. So I think there's definitely chances for Medvedev to make a really deep run here. His half of the draw is emptier. And yeah, we'll just have to keep an eye on him and see how he goes. Well, I'm sure we'll be assessing him still further. Oh, uh, I've seen someone mention Sloan Stevens, and I do actually remember that one of the uh, questions that asked prior to the stream was about Stevens. Um, I, the question went along the lines of what do you think uh, of Stevens and kind of her team not seeming to really care about her results? And she, I think she's lost like 11 times in the first round of a Grand Slam now. I think it's difficult to assess Stevens. 
right now and her results currently compared to other results that she's had because she's had a tough time of it. Within the past couple of months, she's lost multiple family members to the coronavirus, very sadly, and mentally she's not going to be all in there. So I'm not going to be taking a huge amount from her matches at the moment. I think it's very easy to kind of forget about what's happening off court and not to bear that in mind when you're assessing someone's results. But, you know, she does have the talent to be racking up better results than she does. What's the issue? You know, apart from off-court things, to be honest, I can't comment too much because I haven't watched her as much recently. I do know that Putintseva, who she lost to, is a very tricky player. You know, she beat Naomi Osaka on the fastest surface, grass, at Wimbledon in 2019. Got the three-set win over Stevens there. I think when Stevens lost last week as well, it was to Leila Fernandez, who was another dark horse of mine that went out first round, but she struggled with the whole situation. And yeah, so I, I think Stevens is actually her last two matches have come um, against tricky players. Patinsova, the higher ranked player there, actually. Stevens unseeded and Patinsova seeded number 26. So obviously things need to be looked at going forwards, but I'm hesitant to comment too much on Stevens at the moment because she's had it rough and that's just the way it is. Uh, what else do we have? Okay. Uh, someone's asking, should Sinner's match have been scheduled on Tuesday instead of Monday, considering he played the final on Sunday? Yeah, I did know that um, they, they were going to try and you know, schedule to help the players that had been affected by the quarantine, etc., and try and help the players that had competed in finals. But, you know, when you've got two halves of the draw, it is difficult to juggle it around. So at the end of the day, it's a grand slam during a global pandemic. It's not going to run like clockwork. And unfortunately, there are going to be casualties. I think Sinner probably was one. Another one was Dan Evans. He won a title on Sunday. He got to play his first round on Tuesday and still lost. It was against Cam Norrie and he absolutely hates that matchup. So I did have Norrie down to come through that anyway. But he did comment on kind of feeling some fatigue and that having an impact. So yeah, there were going to be casualties and it's a shame, but hey, at least Sinner and Evans leave here with another trophy to their name. So all is not lost, even if it didn't really happen for them at the big one. Uh, what else have we got? Do you think Nick Kyrgios is a threat for team, providing he beats Hugo Umber? Yeah, definitely. This is why I played down my expectations for Dominic team at this event, because he's got a tough draw there. I think of him, Djokovic, and Nadal, he probably has the toughest draw. Whoever comes through out of Umber and Kyrgios, I think, would give him a run for his money. Kyrgios just loves those big matchups. If teams at top form, I think he should be either of those players because Kyrgios lacks the fitness and Umber lacks the experience. So if team was to hit top form, he should be either of those two players, but I'm not convinced that he is going to hit top form. So to, I mean, to make it short, sweet and to the point, yeah, I, I definitely think that if Kyrgios can make it to face team and if that matchup does materialize, could definitely be a threat. Um... Can Milos Raonic take Novak Djokovic? He can definitely be, he can definitely be a threat to him. Raonic obviously has played some scary tennis here before. He made the semi-finals in I forget which year it was now. Was it 2016? Wow, so long ago. Where did that time go? But I think it was 2016 that Raonic made semis. And obviously he's had his own problems with injury. But in a huge serve. Great net game, great attacking mindset. He's the kind of player that should really have the weapons to beat Djokovic. It's all about consistency, though, because, you know, he can open up the court and he can move in, but Djokovic is then going to throw in some uncomfortable angles at the net. And it's all about your consistency, your mentality, how good your focus is. And, you know, Djokovic just wears opponents down, however good their repertoire. So can he take him? It really depends, I think, on Djokovic's level and if it drops from that first round because uh, from what I saw, and I will say like, I didn't watch the full match in tense because I was watching multiple matches at the same time, but from what I saw, I thought Djokovic was looking strong compared to what I saw of him at the end of last season, which frankly was just not close to his best. So yeah, it's a tough call, but I, I would be backing Djokovic there.
It's not really so tough. Why did I do that? I don't know. Um, we will see. We will see. Uh, I won't be doing any predictions for deeper in the tournament yet. We'll have a live Q&A after each of the first, second, and third rounds, and then we'll be doing preview and predictions videos for the quarterfinals. Five more minutes on this, I think, and then we'll wrap it up, and I'll be back after round two. So if you've got any last-minute questions, throw them in. How do I rate Raonic's performance? And will the GOAT, Tomic, have any chance against Shapovalov? Uh, we do love a legend, right? Uh, I think, do you know what? I think Tomic probably does have a chance. Um, anyone has a chance that goes out on court and backs themselves. Uh, Tomic can be really frustrating because he, when he's playing his best tennis, you know, he's so steady, he gets so many balls back, and uh, he doesn't look like he's moving particularly quickly, but he has really good reach, and I think he is, I think he is motivated at the moment. I saw an interview that he did with uh, Vicky Duval during uh, back end of last year, and he was saying about kind of how he needed needed this time off to to kind of you know, just forget tennis for a bit and get his mind back in a good place. He's in a great place off the court. Um, yeah, I, I, mean, I don't want to put down expectations for that match because with Tomic, you just never know. But, you know, again, him against Shapovalov, I quite like that matchup of styles. So it, it will be interesting to see if that becomes a close encounter and a close contest. Uh, Raonic's performance, I don't think I can really talk about that because I don't remember watching it. Um, on this occasion. So many first round matches to keep track of. Um, he played Federico Coria. He beat him 6-3, 6-3, 6-2. Six, to me, that looks solid. Corentin Mute is his next opponent, and Mute is in some hot form at the moment and can play from all areas of the court. So that will probably be his first test, I think, for the number 14 seed. So we'll see how he goes there. Interesting to see the interest in Raonic. He's, I think, someone that can be really overlooked just because of how back and forth he's been in recent times with his injuries. But he's, yeah, I, I don't know if you'd call him a dark horse, but he's definitely someone that can deliver uh, on this stage. What else have we got? <laughs> Who is O'Connell and has the Stun the Beast Streff? Chris O'Connell, he's Australian. Um, I've him a few times I think he plays actually a lot at challenger level and yeah beat Streff 767661 uh, this is why I didn't put expectations on Streff because I so rate him as a player he's really stepped up and improved over the last couple of seasons he's had some good wins at slams uh, he's pushed the the elite players of the sport, but just when you think he's hitting his stride, he will have an off one or two matches, and yeah, he didn't have fantastic form, I don't think, kind of coming into this, so yeah, I didn't watch that match, but I imagine that Streff probably wasn't playing between 80 and 100%, but you know, O'Connell, I have seen him play before, and he's solid, so, and he, because he's Aussie, you know, I think he's Aussie. I hope I've got that right. Yeah, he is. So we'll have had the crowd support as well. And I mean, we have to look at Alexei Popperin, who beat David Goffin in five sets. Popperin, the magic happened to him at the Australian Open. And that energy, the Australian crowd, even if it's half capacity, they know how to bring energy. And that that can certainly be a benefit to their players, whatever they're ranking. Uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> Sampras, he's, uh, he's not playing this tournament. So scoreline opponent performance as Serena showed a dominant scoreline. It doesn't necessarily tell the whole story. How much weight would you allocate for each category when ac um, accessing a win? Yeah, I did speak about Serena's performance and how the scoreline was, in my opinion, quite deceptive. Um, I don't think it was in hers, but in mine watching it was. Um, yeah, I thought that was quite deceptive. But how much weight would I allocate for each category when assessing a win for someone? Scoreline opponent performance. I mean, I think it has to be almost um, an equal combination of the last two. So the opponent and the performance. The scoreline, the scoreline, I don't think at the end of the day really tells you much if you're just looking at the scoreline because someone could play a very average match and just win the big points, kind of in a similar way to Serena maybe, and win one and one. And so that one and one scoreline tells you nothing about how she actually played. Whereas, you know, the opponent, Egerman, she's got variety, but she is subject to kind of crippling under a bit of pressure there. 
And, you know, the performance at the end of the day, that's the thing that is rock solid and on the racket of the player that you're assessing. So um, I think if you were ranking it, you know, uh, the, the weight would go in order first performance, second opponent, third scoreline. I think the worst thing that you can do is look at a scoreline and make assumptions. And I'm sorry for any time in the past that I've done that because it's really starting to frustrate me. I feel like I have to watch every single match for myself to get an accurate picture and it should not be that way. So, okay, I'm gonna wrap up very soon, guys. Um, what are your thoughts on Goff versus Vitalina tomorrow? It's another of those matches that wouldn't be too impressive, but that Goff could quite easily win. Uh, just because Zvitalina, I've said it time and again, there's no real depth. Like, no, her, her A game can beat a number of players. I admire her commitment. I admire her competitiveness. I admire what she's achieved over the years. But she needs more layer in that game. It needs to go deeper. She played Nadia Podoroska at the French Open, a match that, you know, by ranking she should well have won. And she had no she had no answers when Podoroska was taking the game to her. Now, Goff, for all the coverage surrounding her, is not at this moment in time a big hitting power player. Her strengths lie in her mentality and her athleticism. So if she can extend the rallies against Vitalina, she can definitely cause her some trouble. Like I've always said, she has a head for the big moments. So I 100% would not be surprised to see Goff win that match. Um, but yeah, as far as Vitalina goes, it, it would probably be a good match for her to come through because it, it would show that she's kind of... I don't know, having to problem solve a bit more as we saw with Naomi Osaka and her probably the worst performance I've seen from her since I saw her get beaten like one and one on grass a few years ago in Nottingham. Uh, play, played a really bad match, Osaka, against Goff here last year. Couldn't put a ball in the court. So Goff is definitely a mentally tough matchup for a lot of these top players that frankly don't want to lose to a kid. So yeah. I, you, you can probably keep an eye on that one for an upset and apologies to Zvitalina if she actually does go through some different gears in that match um, got a good feeling about Alina Rybakina or Rybakina at this tournament tough section of the draw but she can definitely play 100% yeah she's a dark horse for me and you know I kind of had her and Sakari as kind of dark horse kind of long shots for the title at this event and Rybakina great mentality, great focus, great game face, great strike on the ball. Yeah, why not? Uh, okay, I'm going to wrap up within the next minute or so. Do I think the faster court condition impact Djokovic's game is he's a bit older, movement might not be so good? His movement was fantastic in his first round match. It's always been one of the strengths of his game. And, you know, as much as Djokovic isn't a power player, I do think the pace, if he's got his footwork going and if he's got his fitness, that is something he can actually utilize with his timing and with how hard he sends his backhand down and stuff. So yeah, I, I don't think that Djokovic will be har harmed too much unless he's up against a player that's really just taking it to him from the offset. What do I, what do I think about her? Um, sorry. <laughs> what do I think about Francesca Jones? Um, I think she's great. I first saw her at an ITF event a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, everyone knows about her now. It's been, international coverage for her. I actually last saw her in December. She was playing one of the national British events at the National Tennis Center, uh, beat Jodie Burridge, who's a great rising prospect, pushed Heather Watson close. She just backs herself and has quite a fire forehand as well, can definitely use faster conditions. So definitely a name to keep an eye on for the future. Um, her ambitions are high. She's open about it. Love to see that. Do, do, do. Andrescu has a chance 100% if she's fit if she can go out on court she definitely has a chance can Karolina Pliskova take her first Grand Slam title totally gonna jinx it but in my opinion no she just gets so close and always falls at the final hurdle or to someone that's having a better day than she is so Pliskova not a front runner for me and okay gonna wrap it up there I, I did give it an extra oh, nearly an extra 20 minutes than what I said so thanks to those that have hung around thank you for your questions if you didn't get to ask a question had something Australian Open related that you wanted to throw out there come back to the Q&A at the end of round two I shall see you then monitor your sleep well if you're in the UK or anywhere other than Australia um 
get that energy going for a, a big night ahead of us. That's a, a cracking order of play. So yeah, thank you for watching and I hope this was of some interest and I will see you next time.